is going to be a bit of an unusual session uh, for me because um, I'm actually working from a text. Um, I think the last time I worked from a text was about 30 years ago. And I, I'm not used to it. Um, and, I, and I'm working at it, uh, using it this way for two reasons. One is I have a text, which is also extremely unusual. <laughs> um, and probably haven't had one for 30 years or either. But uh, the second reason is that the subject matter is a little bit complicated and while I could riff on it and would do so, I thought it would be rather more important to sort of lay things out uh, in a, a systematic way and to do that uh, I think the text uh, helps me do it. Um, the topic uh, this week is uh, anti-value. Um, and when I get to the end, I think I'll be able to explain a little bit why this is such uh, an important uh, question for me. But I get into it in the following way. Uh, the closing sentences of the first section, the first chapter of Volume 1 of Capital read, Nothing can be of value without being an object of utility. If the thing is useless, so is the labour contained in it. The labour does not count as labour and therefore creates no value. With this uh, incisive thrust, Marx introduces us to the idea that the circulation of capital uh, as value is vulnerable, that it can come to an abrupt halt, that the threat of devaluation, of loss of value, always hovers over it as it circulates. The transition from the commodity form to the money representation of value is a passage fraught with danger that passage which you see on the main graph here in which we move from the commodity which is produced to being realized in money form. Throughout volume one as we've seen Marx for the most part lays aside questions of realization in order to concentrate on the process of production of material commodities and the production of surplus value. He knows full well of course that and I quote while living labor creates value the circulation of capital realizes value. The unity that necessarily prevails between production and realization is, however, a contradictory unity. Hence, the warning shot at the outset of Volume 1. Commodities may be in love with money, but as he later on points out, the course of true love never did run smooth. <laughs> <laughs> now, it would be very unlike Marx to formulate a key concept such as value without incorporating within it the possibility for its negation. In certain readings of Marx, much is made of the influence of Hegel's negation of the negation on his thinking. And he was certainly not averse, as he put it, to coquetting with Hegelian formulations. The bourgeois mind, then as now, considered dialectic a scandal and an abomination, he wrote, because dialectics includes in its positive understanding of what exists a simultaneous recognition of its negation, its inevitable destruction, because it regards every historical developed form as being in a fluid state, in motion, and therefore grasps its transient aspect as well. And this comes from one of the prefaces uh, to Volume 1 of Capital. The proposition I want to examine is that value in Marx exists only in relation to anti-value. While this may sound a strange formulation, physicists these days rely upon the relation between matter and antimatter to interpret foundational physical processes. Marx often cited parallels uh, between what he was doing and the physicists, and had this analogy been available to him, he probably would have used it. The evolutionary laws of capital, I submit, hinge upon the unfolding relation between value and anti-value, in much the same way as the laws of physics rest on relations between matter and antimatter. Now, there's nothing mystical or obscure about the negation of value in the act of realization. All capitalist commodity producers know that the success of their enterprise is assured only when their commodity has been sold for a money value that is greater than that which they initially expended. If they cannot do this, then they are no longer capitalists. The value they imagined they had after uh, they had put wage laborers to work disappears. But then the concept of the negation of value has an even more omnipresent role than this. In Marx's world, this is not an unfortunate accident, but a deep and abiding feature of what capital is about. And I quote him, 
While capital is reproduced as value and use value in the production process, it is at the same time posited as not value, something which first has to be realized as value by means of exchange. In other words, both the prospect and the reality of anti-value are always there. Anti-value has to be overcome if value production is to survive. Capital is value in motion, and any pause or even slowdown in that motion for whatever reason means a loss of value which may be resuscitated in part, if not in whole, only when the motion of capital is resumed. And I quote, when capital takes on a particular form, as a production process, as a product waiting to be sold, as a commodity circulating in the hands of merchant capitalists, as money waiting to be transferred or reinvested, then capital is virtually devalued. Capital lying at rest in any of these states is variously termed negated, fallow, dormant or fixated. Well, consider this. As long as capital remains frozen in the form of finished product, it cannot be acted as capital. It is negated capital. This virtual devaluation is overcome or suspended as soon as capital resumes its movement. Now, I put together in those things a collage of statements from various parts of Marx. But I think it's fairly clear from these statements that he did not regard anti-value as hovering over value in motion, but the advantage of seeing devaluation as a necessary moment of the realization process is that it enables us to see immediately the possibility of a general devaluation of capital, in other words, a crisis. Any failure to maintain a certain velocity of circulation of capital through the various phases of production, realization, and distribution will produce difficulties and disruptions. This is, of course, what the assumption of everything exchanging at its value in volume one of capital avoids. Continuity of capital flow is vital. The turnover time of capital becomes a crucial consideration. Crises will all result if inventories build up, if money lies idle for longer than is strictly necessary, if more stocks are held for a longer period during production, and so forth. And then he says this, a crisis occurs not only because a commodity is unsaleable, but because it is not saleable within a particular period of time. As long as capital remains in the production process, it is not capable of circulating, and it is virtually devalued. As long as it remains in circulation, it is not capable of producing. As long as it cannot be brought to market, it is fixated as product. As long as it has to remain on the market, it is fixated as commodity. As long as it cannot be exchanged for conditions of production, it is fixated as money. In other words, when you look at this schema I'm looking at, you have to look at it as continuous flow. And any break in the continuity of that flow signals a crisis. Capitalists are therefore locked in a perpetual battle not only to produce values, but to combat their potential negation. The passage of production from production to realization is a key point in the overall circulation of capital where that battle is right royally fought out. So what circumstances might make it impossible for value to be realized in the market? To begin with, if no one wants, needs, or desires a particular use value and offer in a particular place and time, then the product has no value. It is not even worthy of being called a commodity in Marx's view. Potential buyers must also possess sufficient money to pay for the use value. If one or other of these conditions is not met, then the result is no value. We will later investigate in some detail why these two conditions may not be fulfilled. But plainly, the production and management of new wants, needs, and desires has had a huge impact on the history of capitalism, turning what we like to call human nature into something necessarily changing and malleable, rather than constant and given, if it ever was. Capital messes with our heads as well as with our desires. But there is one feature at the moment of realization of great significance. The foundational social relation involved in realization is that between buyers and sellers. Even the lowest paid worker enters the marketplace endowed with the sacred right of consumer choice. This is very different from the capital labor relation that dominates in the process of valorization. To be sure, the encounter between capital and labor in the marketplace is an encounter where the rules of market exchange formally apply. So capital rules both demand and supply conditions through the production of an industrial reserve army. But in the case of valorization, it is what happens in the hidden abode of production that really matters. And for that, there is no equivalent in the process of realization. 
In the latter case, the buyers of commodities, of no matter what class, exercise some degree of consumer choice, either individual or collective. While it is broadly true that the wants, needs and desires of the buyers have been manipulated over time by all sorts of direct and indirect means into patterns of rational consumption, as defined by capital, there have always been pockets and sometimes whole social movements of resistance to such manipulations. Collective consumer choices can be exercised in a variety of ways, including, for example, through state policies with regard to the social wage, forced through by legislation at the behest of long-standing political movements. Resistances arise on moral, political, cultural, aesthetic, religious, and even philosophical grounds. In some instances, the resistance is to the very concept of commodification and market rationing of access to basic goods and services, such as education, health care, and potable water. Many would regard such goods as basic human rights, rather than as commodities that are going to be bought and sold. The anti-value that arises from technical glitches and hold-ups in the circulation of capital morphs into the active anti-value of political resistance to commodification and privatization. Anti-value therefore defines an active field, field of anti-capitalist struggle. Consumer boycotts, though rarely successful, are one sign of this kind of politics. But all movements against conspicuous or even compensatory consumerism constitute a political threat to realization. Capitalists have to organize to counter this threat. But the existence of multiple ongoing struggles in and around the politics of realization is undeniable. Organized struggles, resistances, and agitations over daily life issues in urban settings are commonplace, no matter whether they are explicitly meant as anti-capitalist struggles or not. Marx did not investigate these questions. He merely notes them in passing. But here, I think the virtue of the overall framework that he constructs to represent the circulation of capital becomes more evident. In other words, when you start to look at this flow process, we start to look at those points where there are potential barriers, potential blockages to the continuity of the flow. Of course, once capital is valued, uh, is realized, then it can remain capital only by circling back into production to be valorized by the further application of labor in production. And it is at the point of valorization, when money returns to refinance the labor process, that capital encounters its other most persistent threat of active negation in the persona of the alienated and recalcitrant laborer. The working class, however defined, is the embodiment of the negation of capital of anti-value. It is on the basis of this conception of alienated labor, the Tronti, Negri, and the Italian autonomistas, build their theory of labor resistance and class struggle at the point of production. The act of refusal to work is anti-value personified. This class struggle occurs in the hidden abode of production. It entails a quite different politics from that between buyers and sellers that dominates at the moment of realization. In producing surplus value, the laborer produces capital and reproduces the capitalist. The refusal to work is a refusal to do either. In the same way that Marx invokes the idea of contradictory unity between production and realization from the standpoint of continuous capital accumulation, so there is a parallel need for anti-capitalist movements to recognize the contradictory unity of struggles over production and those waged around realization. On the surface, the politics of realization struggles have a very different social structure. They're not class defined in the way the struggle is defined and the point of production. For this reason, they are often treated on the left as entirely separate struggles, with valorization being prioritized as more important. Yet both sorts of struggles, and this is the point about seeing the totality this way, both sorts of struggles are subsumed within the overall logic and dynamism of capital circulation viewed as a totality. Why would their contradictory unity not be recognized and addressed by anti-capitalist movements? The study of this contradictory unity reveals pregnant with its opposite. To the degree that all economy ultimately reduces itself to economy of time, so even after the capitalist mode of production is abolished, and here I'm quoting Marx, though social, though social production remains, the determination of value still prevails in the sense of the regulation of labor time and the distribution of social labor among various production groups becomes more essential than ever, as well as the keeping of accounts on this. So that Marx, can, you can view this in two ways. One is that Marx is arguing for the abolition of the capitalist law of value. 
Uh, the other is that he's arguing for this revolutionary transformation into another form of the law of value, which is not <coughs> the same as the capitalist law, but addresses the question of how do we calibrate and think about the social labor we do for others. This would be so, for example, as associated laborers in command of their own labor processes and means of production set about coordinating their capacities with those of others while satisfying their own wants, needs and desires with the help of those others. A perpetual jousting goes on in Marx's text between what, what value currently is and what it might be in an anti-capitalist world. The aim, as I interpret it, well, one I prefer, is not to abolish value, though there are some who prefer to put it that way, but to transform its meaning and its content. And in this jousting, anti-value is constantly being evoked. In this sense, anti-value constitutes the subterranean soil in which anti-capitalism can flourish in both theory and practice. While Marx is undoubtedly correct in seeing the struggle against capital in the hidden abode of production as different in kind, and therefore of deeper political significance and struggles in the marketplace, we now clearly see production is not the only place where anti-value is of significance. Value and anti-value relate within the circulation of capital, however, in a variety of ways. The role of anti-value is not always, it turns out, oppositional. It also has a key role in defining and securing the future of capital itself. And in fact, internal revolutions within the capitalist mode of production are to some degree a product of anti-value. This brings me to what I think is uh, one of the more important ideas that I want to explore. And it's the idea of debt as anti-value. Now, how does debt arise? And what is its role within a capitalist mode of production? Consider the case of long-term fixed capital investments. Capital is laid out to purchase a machine which has a relatively long life. The use value of the machine over its lifetime is to augment the productivity of the laborer and thereby produce relative surplus value for capital. The value of the machine is transferred by accounting conventions to the value of the product on an annual basis over the lifetime of the machine. The machine lives is 10 years, the last 10 years and one tenth of its value goes into the product every year. The transfer of value is, as Marx calls it, ideal rather than material, which is a mental activity rather than material activity. The proportion of the value of the machine received each year by the capitalist in money form has to be hoarded, saved, to purchase a new machine when the old machine wears out. Hoarded capital is, as we've seen earlier, dead capital and devalued capital. Anti-value in the form of negated capital accumulates annually until enough has been saved to purchase a new machine when the time is right. The savings of consumers to buy big ticket items like cars and houses are similarly structured. Vast amounts of dead capital or fallow savings hidden under the mattresses in the case of consumers pile up. The accumulation of hoarded dead capital and savings increases with increasing mechanization. The credit system comes to the rescue. The industrial capitalist has, in fact, a choice. Either borrow to buy the machine and pay back the debt in installments over the lifetime of the machine, or buy the machine outright and place the annual depreciation on the money market to earn interest until, until it is needed to replace the machine. In either case, debt is anti-value that circulates within the credit system. Trading in debt becomes an active element within the financial system. This creates greater liquidity in the credit system, which transforms hoarded and hence devalued capital into an active form of capital in motion. That is, instead of capital sort of being put to one side and you're unable to use it, what debt does is it allows, and the credit system it allows all of that hoarded stuff to be extracted out and back, put back into circulation. The point of call here, of course, is that the debt has at some point to be redeemed through value production. Collisions between value and anti-value within the credit system spark periodic monetary and financial crises. In the long run, capital has to confront ever-escalating claims on future values to redeem the anti-value building up within the credit system. Instead of an accumulation of values and of wealth, capital produces an accumulation of debts that have to be redeemed through future value production. 
the anti-value of debt becomes one of the principal incentives and levers to ensure the further production of value and surplus value. The traditional conventional view has always been that the search for profit on the part of individual capitalists has been the primary incentive driving the endless circulation and accumulation of capital. Uh, this is an ideological view which is always trotted out, and that with some interest, uh, that uh, in political cycle of the United States, the figure of the small business owner and the enterprising entrepreneur hemmed in by government regulation emerges as the hero of whatever it, whatever it is is supposedly makes capitalism in the United States so great. The small business, you know, kind of blood. Uh, this evocation is probably more rhetorical, um, a rhetorical mask than a reality. But as we saw in the equalization of the rate of profit through competition, profit signals do not lead to the maximization of surplus value production. The profit signals are misleading, if not downright wrong. Following them may lead to falling profits and crises such as that of the 1930s. Falling profits uh, actually, at some point, makes individual entrepreneurs say they're not going to be bothered to continue producing because it's unprofitable. <coughs> Two solutions then emerge. The centralization of capital in large corporations to lessen the force of competition, and or state interventions to incentivize accumulation through the manipulation of the conditions of realization. That is, the incentive no longer lo is located in the valorization process, it's actually located in the realization process by the manipulation and organization of effective demand. This broadly became the case from 1945 to 1980 throughout much of the capitalist world. Competitive capitalism ceded ground to what some like to call state monopoly capitalism, while Keynesian state policies arranged incentives along quite different lines focusing on aggregate effective demand. The trouble was, of course, that this empowered significant segments of the working class, whose anti-value and anti-capitalist sentiments became all too clear. Hence the shift towards greater and greater reliance on the, common, on the current dominant incentive structure constituted by finance capital. That is, you can't go to valorization. The effective <coughs> demand realization arena where you do it is lost, and so you go to the distributed one. Hence the shift towards greater and greater reliance on that, on the channeling of vast flow of interest-bearing capital into the circulation process, indebting anything and everything in sight that moves. This locks in value production way into the future and effectively forecloses upon alternatives unless a massive disruption breaks open a way to default on such obligations. This became the chosen path of capital that allowed Margaret Thatcher to so confidently claim there is no alternative. You have to retire your debts and that's it. Valorization, realization and distribution have always been in play, of course, as independent but interrelated centres within the circulation of capital, where incentives to endless accumulation could be constructed. But their relative importance has shifted with changing circumstances. The massive deployment of anti-value within the financial system to ensure future value production is relatively new. There have also been geographical shifts. Until very recently, capital accumulation in China has been dominated by state investments in productive consumption, physical infrastructures and therefore it's taking uh, the realization path. But in recent, last two, two or three years, there's been a dramatic shift underway towards the liberation of the financial system. Now, this recent shift towards uh, indebtedness uh, poses serious problems for anti-capitalist opposition. It becomes harder and harder to put a face to the class enemy. While the tentacles of indebtedness spread far and wide to implicate every one of us who carries as much as a single credit card in their pocket. Capital, in the first instance, cultivated debt as anti-value as a solution to specific problems, such <coughs> as the dangers of excessive hoarding. The power of anti-value was used to release all the dormant value. And here, I think there's a wonderful moment where Marx talks about the difference between a miser and a capitalist. The boundless drive for enrichment may be common to the capitalist and the miser, he says in volume one, but while the miser is merely a capitalist gone mad, the capitalist is a rational miser. <laughs> the ceaseless augmentation of value which the miser seeks to attain by saving his money from circulation is achieved by the more acute capitalist by means of throwing his money again and again into circulation. And this he could only do if there was an active credit system and open money market. 
I always think of uh, Balzac's novel, Eugenie Grande, uh, which is about, uh, you know, the miser who, end, and the end of the story is he's trotting off and to convert his gold into, into rents, uh, into credit system. Now, Marx does lightly touch upon this problem in Volume 1 of Capital. He notices that the role of creditor or of debtor results from the simple circulation of commodities. This relation is implicit in market exchange. But then Marx goes on to hint rather darkly as to how this role is only a reflection of an antagonism which lies deeper at the level of the economic conditions of existence. And it's not clear from this text what this deeper antagonism is about. Is Marx referring here to the hidden dialectic of value and anti-value relation? Uh, I like to think so. Relations between debtors and creditors long preceded the rise of capital as a dominant mode of production, of course. The issue for Marx and for us, and as in the case of rent and profit on the merchant's capital, is how the debt-credit relation is perpetuated and transformed into a fundamental driving force of value in motion, and with what consequences. The development of microfinance in India recently now has some 12 million individuals hooked into having to pay off loans by producing as much value as they possibly can. If they cannot do so or actively refuse as a matter of political will, then their assets, often land and property, are foreclosed upon. This is the famous trick of the subprime mortgage. Piling up debt on vulnerable and marginalised population is, in short, the way to discipline the borrowers into being productive labourers, productive defined as productive of value that can be appropriated by capital in the form of an exorbitant interest rate. More close to home, the future freedoms of debt-encumbered students and debt-encumbered homeowners are severely, severely curtailed. It is no accident that this way of procuring value production into the future has surged to the fore as capital finds it harder and harder to organise value production along conventional lines and to incentivize that uh, by any other means. On the other side of the ledger, my pension fund is invested in debt, in the belief that that debt will be redeemed. But that future, if that future does not materialise and the debt is not re redeemed, then the fictitious value of my pension fund disappears into the black hole of anti-value. Read about the state of pensions in the world today, and you will see a crisis looming of unfunded liabilities stretching endlessly into the future. <coughs> National debts appear even more intimidating. In the same way that individuals are controlled by their debts, so states are weighed down with the anti-value wielded by their bondholders. The danger exists that the economic system will collapse under the dead weight of anti-value. What happened to Greece after 2011 is a small-scale example. When debt becomes so huge that there is no prospect for future value production to redeem it, then debt peonage rules. The formation and circulation of interest-bearing capital is, in effect, the circulation of anti-value. Now, it may seem strange to think of the main financial centres of today's global capitalism such as the City of London, Wall Street, Frankfurt, Shanghai and the like, as centres of anti-value formation. But that is what all the debt bottling plants that dominate the skylines of these global cities truly signify. The danger, which Marx hinted, hinted at in his writings on banking, finance and fictitious capital formation, is that in the absence of any firm material base as to what money is about, and in the context of political forces dominated by a global oligarchy, armed with self-serving but erroneous economic theories, reinforced by clear ideological preferences for unregulated market freedoms, then capital in general will degenerate into one vast Ponzi scheme in which last year's debts are retired by borrowing even more money the year after. The central banks are currently creating sufficient new money to prop up stock exchange and asset values for the benefit of the oligarchy in the here and now. This then leaves the central bank with the problem of how to retire the debts they have accumulated on their balance sheets. The scenario of this escalating social inequality that Marx depicted in his conclusion to Volume 1 of Capital will become even more emphatic, though achieved this time by different mechanisms of financial manipulation. The rich grow richer through financial manipulations, while the poor become poorer through the necessity to redeem their debts, both individual and collective, as in state borrowings. Meanwhile, valorization seems almost an afterthought, left to the poorest countries on planet Earth to struggle with. The concept of anti-value reaches an apogee in the massive devaluations that occur at times of major crises. In Volume 1 of Capital, Marx provides us with a concrete example of how this works. He disputes Say's law, accepted by Ricardo, which states that since every sale implies a purchase, then sales and purchases must always be in equilibrium. Acceptance of this so-called law implies that general crises are impossible. 
This would be the case in a pure barter economy. In a monetized economy, however, simple circulation takes the form of commodity to money to commodity and back again. There is nothing that impels somebody who sold for money to immediately use that money to buy another commodity. If all economic agents decide, for some reason, e.g. a breakdown of faith in the system, to hold and save money, then circulation ceases and the economy crashes as value is negated. This is what Keynes later defined as the liquidity trap. Anti-value prevails over value because value can remain value only through continuous motion. The cumulative loss, devaluation of asset values, in the United States in the crisis of 2007-2008 was, for example, calculated to be something of the order of $15 trillion, which is close to the market value of one year's total output of goods and services. The importance of the pairing of value and anti-value in Marxist thinking is either ignored or given short shrift in presentations on the subject. subject. But, but a dialectical formulation based upon the negation of value, a formulation that classical and neoclassical economics can't possibly grasp, given their positivist inclinations. This is fundamental to understanding the crisis tendencies of capital. Whether Marx himself understood all the implications of this is an interesting question. His lengthy and often confusing investigation of the British financial system in Volume 3 of Capital show he understood very well that an accumulation of money capital means for the most part nothing more than an accumulation of claims to future production. Banking and credit were becoming the most powerful means for driving capitalist production beyond its own barriers. This comes back to the whole kind of question of how uh, the continuation of this system is, is incentivized. Uh, they were also becoming, he said, the most effective vehicle for crises and swindling. An unchecked accumulation of fictitious capital could mean that all connection with the actual process of capitalist valorization is lost, right down to the last trace. The effect would be, he said, to confirm the illusion that capital is automatically valorized by its own powers, which is an incredible fetishized belief, which is widespread in the population. I put money in a savings account and it accrues interest at a compounding rate over time. It appears magical. I do nothing and it grows. But now that seems to be the way in which the whole economy is supposed to grow. No wonder Marx thought of the financial system as the height of the fetish tendencies of capital. The credit system, he says, is an imminent form of the capitalist mode of production, and one of the key powers that impels the endless accumulation of capital. And I quote, the valorization of capital founded on the antithetical character of capitalist production permits actual free development only up to a certain point, which is constantly broken through by the credit system. The credit system hence accelerates the material development of the productive forces and the creation of the world market. At the same time, credit celebrates the violent outbreaks of this contradiction, the crises, and with these, the elements of dissolution of the old mode of production. The credit system has a dual character. On the one hand, it develops the motive of capitalist production, enrichment by the exploitation of others' labor, into the purest and most colossal system of gambling and swindling, and restricts even more the already small number of the exploiters of social wealth. On the other hand, however, it constitutes the form of transition towards a new mode of production, it is this that gives the principal spokesman for credit that nicely mixed character of swindler and prophet. Now, Marx, in writing, that's a big quote from Marx. Alas, I may comment, uh, Mar the masters of the universe, as the Wall Street is often called, have performed far better as swindlers, even as they cultivate the art of false prophecy to justify their swindling. Uh, alas, also, there are a few signs that the evolution of the credit system and the clearly increasing power of the circulation of interesting bearing capital to dictate futures, constitutes a transitional stepping stone towards the emergence of some new mode of production. Indeed, the imaginary we're left with is of a horde of insatiably greedy investors possessed of deep enough pockets to buy off almost any serious opposition, force-feeding the rest of the world a diet of indigestible credit money uh, that then has to be redeemed uh, later down the line by everybody working under conditions of debt peonage. Why would financiers celebrate the violent outbreaks of crises? At first blush, this seems counterintuitive. But when it comes to the circulation of anti-value, then a crisis is indeed a moment of triumph for the forces of anti-value, even as it visits despair upon all those engaged in the production and realization of value. In a crisis, said the banker Andrew Mellon way back in the 1920s, assets return to their rightful owners, i.e. him. <laughs> crises typically leave in their wake a mass of devalued assets that can be picked up at fire sale prices by those who have the cash or privileged connections to pay for them. 
This is what happened in 1997-8 in East and Southeast Asia. Perfectly viable firms went bankrupt for lack of liquidity, were bought out by foreign banks and then sold back a few years later at a huge profit. In crises, Marx typically evokes the possibility of, one, the physical destruction and degradation of use values, two, the forced monetary depreciation of exchange values, and three, a concomitant devaluation of values as the only rational way to overcome the irrationality of overaccumulation. Notice the language here. Each of the forms involved, use value, exchange value, and value, is subject to a specific form of negation. One form does not automatically imply the other. Devalue and depreciation of exchange values does not necessarily mean the physical destruction of the use values. The latter can become free goods for the revival of capitalist accumulation. This is one of the ways in which anti-value works to restore the conditions of value production. A subway system that went bankrupt, devaluing the subway and depreciating the investors' capital, left behind the use value of the tunnels that we still use when we travel the London Underground. The depreciation of housing values in the crisis of 2007 and 8 in the United States left behind a huge stock of housing use values that could be bought up by private equity companies and hedge funds for a song and put back into profitable use. Now Marx was fully aware of these sorts of possibilities. He notes how capital undertakes investments which do not pay and which pay only as soon as they have become in a certain degree devalued and many undertakings where the first investment is sunk and lost, the first entrepreneur and may not mean any substantial improvement in use values. This, uh, this point I need uh, to push the theory of anti-value onto another topic. The theory of anti-value also has to embrace a whole range of activities which are not productive of value, even though they are essential and necessary to the functioning of capital. This brings us to the full question of unproductive labour, which was discussed at great length by Adam Smith. Marx agreed that workers employed in circulation, e.g. in marketing, do not produce value. Otherwise, he would have to concede that value could be produced by market exchange. <coughs> they can, however, be a source of surplus value. They are like machines which cannot produce value, but whose use can increase relative surplus value by lowering the cost of wage goods, reductions in circulation times amount, says Marx, to re reducing the negation of created values. But if less has to be deducted because of increasing the rate of exploitation of unproductive labour, then more surplus value is left over for the capitalist. Unproductive but socially necessary activities like bookkeeping, retailing and proper state regulation and law enforcement are not inherently anti-capitalist. But if everyone tries to make a living by such means, while nobody engages in production, then capital would die out. The conclusion is obvious. Excessive, as opposed to socially necessary, absorption of labour power and circulation, which does not produce value, along with hyper-bureaucratisation that produces no value within corporations as well as in the state sector, these are all a threat to the reproduction of capital, even without being explicitly anti-capitalist in form or intent. It is one of the accidental ways in which value and motion can come up. Bloated costs and increasing inefficiency of circulation, regulation and bureaucratic supports including policing, can absorb vast amounts of value unproductively. If, as some conventional economists now argue, far too much of the US economy is currently directed to busy but useless activities, then this acts as a drag upon value and surplus value production and circulation. Hence, some hypothesize the great stagnation of contemporary capitalism. And this, of course, is standard fare in almost all right-wing critiques of the state, that excessive regulation and bureaucratization is the big enemy of market freedoms, and hence a full-fledged capitalist development, which supposedly benefits everyone. There was, of course, Marx's most signal accomplishment to show definitively in volume one of capital that totally unregulated free market capitalism would not benefit everyone, but merely concentrate over more wealth and power than the top 1%. But the right-wing critique has more than an element of truth in emphasizing <coughs> the deleterious effects upon value production and circulation of excessive resort to unproductive labor. Economies and, the, and increasing efficiencies and the necessary cost of circulation are therefore crucial, Marx argued, if unproductive labour were not to become a major, if unwitting, locus of anti-value. One unsurprising result is that conditions of exploitation of living labour in these unproductive activities can be as vicious, and in some instances even more so, than they are in production. The balance between socially necessary and excessive unproductive labour is hard to define. Much of political debate about the regulatory environment is precisely caught up in trying to establish adequate norms. 
On this point, Marx's discussion of the regulation of the length of the working day provides an interesting template. Fierce intercapitalist competition for absolute surplus value leads to such extensions of the working day and intensity of labour as to endanger the worker's life, health and ability to labour. It was therefore necessary, even from the standpoint of capital, to institute some collective forms of regulation, to put a floor under competition, as it were, so as to protect capital from the destructive effects on the labour force of ruinous competition. But if the organised power of labour in alliance with other interests became increasingly powerful, so as to restrict the length of the working day even more dramatically, then this would constitute an anti-capitalist threat from the other direction. The adjudication between the rights of labour and the rights of capital over working hours depends on the balance of class forces. Marx's famous line, between equal rights, force decides. The balance between productive and unproductive labour in any capitalist social formation is likewise arrived at by the playing out of social and political processes and struggles. But the main point that I want to make here is that there is a connection uh, to anti-capital and to anti-value, uh, anti uh, which is uh, significant in that state regulation uh, can actually uh, support uh, capital, but there is, comes a point where state regulation uh, can go the other way and be antagonistic to capital. Which brings us to the question of the direct politics of anti-value, uh, which Marx frequently uh, writes about, by the way. Anti-capitalist activities and politics based in devising alternative ways of living outside of commodity production and exchange <coughs> are widespread, though often small scale. If, as Bertel Allman insists, value is alienated labour, then the political quest for an unalienated existence entails the active and conscious negation of the capitalist law of value in individual and collective lives, which leads us to the point of various forms of anti-value politics. Solidarity economies, intentional communities, for example, may seek to ensure their own reproduction beyond the reach of the law of value. Their exchanged relations amongst themselves and wells with others will not necessarily be based on market mechanisms. Anarchist communes, religious-based communities, and indigenous social orders constitute heterotopic spaces within the interstices of the capitalist system, but outside of the rule of the law of value. There is always the danger, of course, that such non-value-producing activities would either be appropriated by capital as a basis for value production, i.e. appropriated as a free gift of human nature, or function as some kind of reserve for the reproduction of the industrial reserve army of increasingly redundant and disposable laborers. Capital creates openings for oppositional politics and circulates and expands. We can imagine capitalist activity at almost any point in this whole circulatory process that we're looking at. Uh, and at the same time, capital also uh, creates it through its mobilization of the powers of art, science, and technology uh, dis uh, which, despite itself, creates an opposition between the rule of value of socially necessary labour time on the one hand and disposable labour time, or not labour time, on the other. It tends on, on the, again, I quite <coughs> Marx, on the one side to create disposable la labour time, on the other to convert it into surplus labour time. If it succeeds too well at the first, then it suffers from surplus production, and then necessary labour is interrupted because no surplus labour can be realised by capital. <coughs> The inability to realize value then becomes an insurmountable barrier, which is the point that we started with. The more this contradiction develops, the more does it become evident that the growth of the forces of production can no longer be bound up with the appropriation of alien labor, but that the mass of the workers must themselves appropriate their own surplus labor, which is, of course, the transitional uh, thing towards a socialist society. This should allow the development of the power of social production such that disposable time will grow for all. A real wealth is a developed productive power of all individuals. The measure of wealth is then not any longer, in any way, labor time, but rather disposable time. The workers can recover that immeasurable sense of value that they lost in the original fictional wage labor contract with capital to condemn them to an alienating existence in which the valorization of capital became their singular, singular destiny. Here we encounter some interesting political paradoxes. Much of the concern in recent critical commentaries has been to incorporate knowledge and science, unpaid household work, and the free gifts of nature into the value calculus. Are they not, after all, a source of value? Marx's answer that they are analogous to the case of machines. They cannot be a source of value as capital defines it, even as they are a source of relative surplus value for the capitalist class, insofar as they contrib contribute to the productivity of labor power. 
There currently is a widespread desire to incorporate the hitherto not valued into the regime of capitalist value and so production and circulation. This strategy is understandable, partly because of the positive connotations that a term like value has, and the understandable demand for recognition of what is all too often ignored. But it gets things entirely the wrong way around politically. It fails to understand the dialectical role of not or anti-value and of unalienated labour and disposable time in oppositional politics. It is from the spaces of not value and unalienated labour that a deep and widespread popular critique of the capitalist mode of production and its distinctive form of value and its alienations can be mounted. And it is from these sites too that the lineaments of a past post-capitalist economy might best be identified. To be a producer of value and surplus value within a capitalist mode of production is, Marx noted, not a blessing, but a misfortune. <laughs> Knowledge, information, cultural activities and the like can all be commodified and integrated into capitalism. At the same time, their potential for unalienated and free activity forms a cutting edge for anti-capitalist politics. From this contradictory position, cultural producers of all sorts form a significant potential block for radical political action. The search for an unalienated life among cultural producers in the face of the appropriation of their products by a parasitical rentier class is a growing point of tension. But for the most part, their politics revolves around conditions of realization, even as their conditions of production are a contested terrain of capitalist control. <coughs> Likewise, the fact that household labor does not enter the, into the value calculus suggests this as another potential site for the articulation of an anti-capitalist politics. <coughs> presuming that its own internal contradictions and alienations with respect to gender, <coughs> patriarchy, sexuality, and child-rearing practices and the like can be resolved. Even as more and more household labor activities become commodified and taken into the market, everything from takeout food to nails and hair cutting, labor time spent in the household increases in spite of, some would say because of, the advent of labor-saving household technologies, <coughs> washing machines and robot vacuum cleaners and the like. But the labour done for others within households and across the broader social solidarities configured around the production and protection of the commons can become a powerful antidote to the dominance of capitalist commodity production and its associated social relation. Granting wages for housework, as if, if it were realistic, which fortunately it is not, simply reassures us that household labours can in principle be integrated into the capitalist mode of production and accorded the status of alienated labour. The wages for housework campaign, also by Venice from the 1970s, was a brilliant intervention that focused attention on the gross neglect of gender questions in the Marxist tradition, was entirely wrong-headed, as some other of its proponents later freely admitted, in the political remedies it, pro it proposed. None of this I, I would have occurred, I submit, had the relation between value and anti-value within the capitalist mode of production been more fully appreciated. There have been parallel moves to integrate the free gifts of nature into the stream of value production by some arbitrary valuation devices, those proposed particularly by environmental economists. This amounts to nothing more than a sophisticated greenwashing and commodification of a space from which a fierce attack upon the hegemony, hegemony of the capitalist mode of production and its and our alienated relation to nature through commodification can be mounted. These are all typical spaces from which an anti-capitalist critique can be fashioned. Yet the predominant political movement in recent times is for integration into the value theory framework. If value under capitalism is about the production of alienated labor and the alienated laborer, then why on earth would anyone who is a progressive campaign to be subsumed within such a regime? Devaluation, finally, can also hit the laborer, as bearer of the commodity labor power. Wages are curtailed and, curtailed and the health and well-being of the laborer are threatened, even as laborers retain their skills and their labor capacities. During the effective nationalization of General Motors in 2008, for example, a dual employment structure emerged in which the older workers maintained their wages and benefits while new workers were hired at much lower wages and with far weaker benefits. The devaluation of labor power and depreciation of its values when prolonged or deepened can lead to physical destruction of the laboring population, even as capital usually falls far short of that for obvious reasons. But none of this passes by without eliciting, eliciting some sort of political response from the laborers, both individual and collective. The power of anti-value has to be confronted in relation to the value theory. If, as I suspect, this is the deeper antagonism buried in the gut of capital circulating as value in motion. Then making this contradiction legible is one important step towards confronting the debt peonage which increasingly seems to enable, seems enabled to dictate not only our contemporary social relations and well-being, but also our prospects for a future life. 
The fact that so many people find it harder to envisage the end of capitalism than the end of the world has everything to do with the fact that the future of capital accumulation is foreclosed and a towering volume of debt is anti-value. For many, the only seeming hope is that some external intervention, apocalyptic event of some sort, will save us. It will not. The only thing that can save us is an explicit winding down, if not demolition, of the tower of debt that dictates our future. Anti-value signals the potential breakdown in the continuity of capital circulation. It prefigures how capital's crisis tendencies can take different forms and move around from one moment, e.g. production, to another, e.g. realisation. This insight is also crucial. Alas, it is often ignored. Crises do not, Marx tells us, contrary to much popular opinion, necessarily spell the end of capitalism, but set the stage for its renewal. It is here that we see most clearly the dialectical role of anti-value in the reproduction of capital as value. Crises are never more than momentary violent solutions to the existing contradictions, says Marx, violent eruptions that re-establish the disturbed balance for the time being. But the reconstitution of capital is insecure and has limits. An accumulation of debts, claims on future value production, may outrun the capacity to produce and realize values and surplus values in the future. Even if the debts are successfully redeemed, the obligation to repay them forecloses on alternative futures. Debt peonage shackles the future for persons as well as for whole economies. This is a theme that I'm going to take up by way of conclusion. So, thanks. Okay.